a fundamental problem, which is that I'm extremely lazy. I have no interest in, in spending my whole day babysitting a, a trading strategy and, and making sure it works properly. Uh, so my solution to that is automation. And my, my trading strategies are pretty much fully automated huge advantage that humans have is the fact that we can adapt immediately. You know, if we can work out what the drivers are, what's going on in the market. Uh, and my the example I always come back to is, is 2008, when a small number of people looked at what was happening to US house prices and said, well, hang on a second, this is going to have implications for the, you know, the leverage mortgage backed securities market. Um, and they were able to infer from that, that they should make certain bets in certain markets. And, and you know, obviously, some of them did extremely well out of that. Now, no trading strategy could ever have done that. In terms of building trading strategies and trading rules, I want my rules to be as simple as possible and not overcomplicate them just for the sake of overcomplicating them or for, you know, a marginal improvement in their historical backtested return. You can go broke two ways. You can either bleed to death slowly by paying too much in costs or you can explode quickly by leveraging your account up too much. That, that, you know, you've got those two options. Welcome to the Earthman Podcast with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, where we explore, discuss, and expand upon all aspects of the mindset, behavioral, and psychological aspects of trading and investing. In this episode, we chat with Robert Carver. Robert is a treasure trove of trading wisdom, knowledge, know-how, and first-hand experience. Coming into trading with a strong background in economics, Robert worked as a trader at a leading investment bank and a $30 billion hedge fund where he ran a major chunk of their trading capital for several years. In addition, Robert has built his own trading systems, traded and still does trade his own money, and is someone who thinks intensely about trading, having written several books on various aspects of trading and trading systems. This chat will fascinate, intrigue and educate you, and will make you a wiser trader, period. Before we start, we would like to thank our podcast partners, TradeStation Global and the Society of Technical Analysts. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets, trade stocks, forex futures and micro e-mini futures from one account. Leverage professional grade tools like Radar Screen, The Matrix and Easy Language, an intuitive coding language for traders. And with TradeStation Global, there are no hidden price spreads, just transparent low commissions. To find out more, and open an account, visit tradestationinternational.com forward slash alpha mind or see the link in the episode description. Tradestation International Limited is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and acts as an introducing broker to Interactive Brokers UK Limited. The firm does not provide investment advice or trading recommendations. Investment and trading involves risk, including possible loss of principal. At present, the TradeStation Global product is not available to EU residents. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, are another long-established organisation with a great reputation. They are a member-led and not-for-profit body who have been providing world-beating education to the trading and investment community for over five decades and serve the needs of their members by providing outstanding online talks and webinars, regular newsletters, education, diplomas and continued professional development programs. Their home study course has been created by many of the world's leading minds in technical analysis and provides learning of a depth and breadth that is unparalleled in the trading and investing world. Listeners to the Alpha Mind podcast can obtain a 10% discount on the cost of the STA home study course. Visit alpha-mind.net and go to the sponsor section of our page to find out how to obtain this. Now, on with this week's podcast. Welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast. Our guest today is Robert Carver. Robert is, um, well, he's an independent futures trader. He's an investor. He's a writer. He's a research consultant. And he's a visiting lecturer at Queen Mary University. We're going to go straight into this. Unfortunately, my co-host Mark can't be with us today. It, it will be just myself and Robert. And um, welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for inviting me on. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here today. I gave you a quick introduction, but I'm sure you can give us a much better introduction to who you are, your background, your history and, and the work you do. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how long have you got? Um... Oh, you could. You, you, you've got a... <laughs> We've got 45 minutes coming up, so okay. if you spend 45 minutes <laughs> talking about myself. Story. I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear me talk about myself for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually, Steve, I was looking at your profile just before I came on, and we, interestingly, we have a lot in common. So uh, the uh, the listeners can't see this, but we're both kind of middle-aged, bald men, uh, which is, which is you know, something we've got in common. <laughs> um, our balding, perhaps. Um, and uh, we both actually started off as um, rates traders, interest rate traders. So, um, so I, I started off trading... Um, 
interest rate, exotic interest rate derivatives for uh, Barclays Capital, as it was then called, about 20 years ago now. Um, and um, that was after doing my first of two degrees that I did in economics. Um, and then I, I kind of found the whole working on a trading floor and having people shouting at me thing, not not really my what I was looking <laughs> for in life. So uh, I took a couple of years out of the city and um, got, got my master's degree part time whilst working for an economics think tank. And then I was very lucky to get a, a job in a large uh, quant systematic hedge fund called AHL. Um, when I was there for seven years, firstly, I was there to set up a systematic global macro strategy, um, and uh, which was kind of an unusual thing for them because they they previously had focused on purely using price, so what you might call technical analysis rather than fundamental analysis. Um, so so I kind of launched that new product for them. Um, and then there was a bit of a business restructure and I ended up taking over the the whole of the fixed income portfolio, um, which is about 40% of the risk. And, you know, it's a $30 billion hedge fund. So it was obviously quite a sizable portfolio. And uh, this this was sort of from 2010 onwards. So quite an interesting time to be doing that job. Um, and then about coming up to nine years ago now, um, terrifyingly, um, I decided um, that I'd sort of had enough of the... Uh, the, the stress and the, the pressures, the pressures of the job, and spending most of my time in meetings, and not enough time doing the stuff that I actually enjoyed. Um, so I decided to leave and sort of see how I could get on by myself. Yeah, as you say, I've done various things since then. I've I've sort of set up my own um, automated futures trading strategy, which I've run for the last eight years. I've written three books around systematic trading and investing. I do my own independent research. I help other people out um, when when I can. Um, and uh, I, yeah, every year I, inf- I, I so as I say, my web page, I inflict a, a course on some poor master students <laughs> on systematic trading who all sign up, I'm sure, thinking they're going to be told the holy grail of how to make, you know, billions of dollars in the systematic uh, trading landscape and discover quite quickly the course most entirely consists of quite dull statistical techniques, which I personally think are very important, but it takes them a while to get motivated to tell them this is really what they need to know to do this business properly. So. So yeah, th- there you go. That was that was about four minutes, I think. So much quicker than than forty five. Okay, fantastic. And and yeah, I think uh, you know, like you said, boarding probably in your fifties. Am I guessing? Uh, forty eight actually, but thanks. Oh, for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do look younger than me, so I was just, I was just <laughs> guessing that. But you're nearly in your fifties. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> but you brought up bald, but I know, I know. You, you, you do, honestly, I know, I know this isn't being rec- the, vi- the video isn't being recorded, but you do look quite a few years younger and less stressed than me. So, well, I ought to be, I ought to be, <laughs> I ought to be. <laughs> but it was interesting hearing your journey because you know, very similar journey to you started in a bank, started in rates, probably, I should imagine, I guess, 10 years before you, at what that was the dawn of derivatives, and they were a lot more vanilla than the ones you, you were trading, I should imagine. But I did the job for 25 years. I both loved it and I hated it at the same time. Definitely had a passion for trading. But there was that side of it, which you mentioned there, the stress of it. It, it, it is a very stressful job and it's a very stressful existence. But you, you, you I, I want to pick up on something you said really at the end there about the Holy Grail, because you're right. Everyone thinks there's there's a Holy Grail out and, and they're also looking for something that's sexy to be the <laughs> Holy Grail. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, you know, being English you would have heard heard that phrase where there's muck there's brass which is someone who's not English it means that there is gold out there within the dirt and the, getting your fingers dirty and your hands dirty and raking through things getting muddy and, and putting in a shift and that that's what trading is it, it's doing the unsexy stuff doing the dull and boring stuff yeah I think there's a there's a quite good metaphor here with um, being a police detective yeah um, because I think you watch these TV shows and particularly the um, the kind of more less serious end of them um, there's always this moment about 15 minutes before the end where the, the police detective has a sudden realization oh well and the, the answer just comes to them right it's like oh they just they just realized they immediately solved the crime all in one go it's very impressive <laughs> it happens every time but but real life police detective work isn't like that yeah it's long hours pouring through research and putting together evidence and trying not to also and this is very important for trading i think particularly systematic trading you know not not making mistakes you know avoiding errors i I think most people who lose money at trading do so because they they make errors that are easily avoidable if you know what you're looking for Uh, and if you can avoid making those errors then you're already ahead of probably 95 percent of traders out there and since roughly 85 percent of traders lose money retail traders anyway so you're you're probably going to be in the the, the percentage point where you're going to make some money oh yeah no a hundred percent and and you know it's really interesting because they, i came across a, a quote on twitter the other day by thomas Paine, and it was actually a, a 
talking about Steve Martin, the comedian, on on facing fears and challenges. And he said, I did stand up comedy for 18 years. I spent 10 years learning, four years refining, and then four years as a royal success. And, and, and the point was that people see pros in their prime and think they were born with it, but they didn't see those previous 14 years of slogging away, hard work, grinding. Yeah, no, I, I think um, a lot of people, to me, good trading is really about knowing that luck is very important and you can't get away from luck because you know trading is about taking risk risk essentially is exposing yourself to luck but, but you can sort of swing the odds in your favor by as i said by not not making mistakes uh, and then of course when you do make money it looks like you know you're some kind of genius but i'm reminded of another famous quote which is the arnold palmer quote you know when when he hit a uh, you know a, an incredible putt one of the spectators shouted out you know you're lucky sod or something and he turned around and said yeah the more i practice the luckier i get I think there's, there's there's definitely an element of that, but yeah. But to me, to me, trading is especially sort of in terms of the the things that I think are really important in trading, which isn't the sexy stuff. It's not like finding the the perfect indicator. To me, it's about managing risk, managing positions, which is very boring and unsexy stuff, right? I mean, no one wants to date a risk manager, right? They want to they want to date the hedge fund manager, the portfolio manager, <laughs> uh, who's who's earning you know a hundred times more and uh, and has got the you know the nice teeth and, and the tan. But but that's the stuff that really matters, the, the the portfolio and the risk management, and that that's to me is about embracing luck and probability and knowing that it's out there but quantifying it and and understanding it and again it, it points to that this is a process with many different aspects and elements to it and i, I guess this, this this next point i make will strike a chord with you as a systematic trader and it goes back to when i read the book about jim simons the man who solved the market there was something in there which really stood out to me where they said that the guy who cleans the data they consider his job as important as anyone else in that entire process. And therefore he's paid as much as the major system designers. Um, yeah, now another another example for me would be that one of the unsexy things, again, that you can do to improve your profitability as a trader is diversifying across lots of different instruments. Um, so you can actually do much better by finding a relatively simple and robust indicator that on any individual instrument isn't that good. But if you can diversify across many, many, many different instruments that are uncorrelated, then your expected profits will increase far more than if you work out, you know, 20 different sexy ways to trade just one instrument like the S&P, for example. Um, so I, I remember, um, you know, hiring um, a graduate um, and, and sort of giving him his project and saying, right, this is your project. You're going to add 50 new instruments to our portfolio and it's going to be very boring. You're going to have to go out there. You're going to have to do exactly that, find the data, you know, work out how to integrate the, the data coming into our data pipeline, clean the data, you know, do all kinds of configuration stuff in databases, test test our strategies against it to make sure it's not doing anything crazy. It's going to be very, very tedious and you're not going to do it once you do it 50 times. And I said, but you know what? You're going to add more value to this fund than any other person working here. Now, sadly for him, he wasn't being paid the same as everybody else because he just he just started, right? Uh, and that's the way the way the cookie crumbles. But but for me at least, that that work that kind of tedious work was likely to add more value. And I think I was proven right as well. If you looked at the performance of that particular fund, you know, it won quite a few awards after that. Um, and one of the main reasons it won those awards was it is exposed to lots of uncorrelated markets that other funds did, didn't have. Uh, you know, and that that graduate on a relatively modest salary. Had, doing that boring work that's what he'd achieved oh fantastic fantastic so 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 robert um you know it's it, it's it's well it really is an honor you know as i'm talking to you i'm realizing what a valuable mine of 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 sort of gold gold dust is coming from you at this point what how the question i want to ask is how would you sum up your philosophy to risk you talk about risk management as being such a vital element how would you what what is your overriding philosophy there you've kind of summed up some of it but if you could perhaps tell our audience what that is in your perspective so there's this very famous quote about risk which actually people think of as a political quote uh, and that's the the Donald Rumsfeld quote right you know there are yes there are no knowns there are no unknowns there are unknown knowns and unknown unknowns um so to me risk is about um saying well there are no knowns and in fact, one of the skills I think in trade, putting together trading strategies, especially systematic ones, is knowing knowing what you know with with high degree of certainty. So, for example, costs, trading costs. I, w I have no idea what my P and L is going to be next tomorrow, next month, in a year's time. Yeah, over ten years, I can probably have some expectation of where it will be, but within a fairly wide band. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you, and I can predict what my costs will be in the next twelve months, to within about ten percent. In other words. 
the like there'll probably be somewhere between about 0.9% of my account value and 1.1% of my account value. So that's a known that's a known known. That so that information should be used, you know, kind of treated as as gold dust. In other words, give a very high value because it's known with all, with a high degree of certainty. Um, so this is kind of kind of if you're familiar with the uh, with the the concept sort of Bayesian way of thinking, with a very high degree of understanding about what costs are, and therefore, given the choice between two strategies, one which looks slightly better on paper but has higher costs, you should actually go with the one with lower costs because that slight edge that's there in a back test statistically is of less information or less value than the information about costs is. So that's no no knowns, which kind of fall outside the, the purview of risk management, if you like. So then what you have to do is say, well, what are known unknowns? So what what risks that are out there am I going to try and model and understand and quantify? And the the whole idea of of kind of creating risk models is really about drawing the line between the the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, if you like, the kind of black swans for what it's worth. So the, what I like to do in terms of the way I look at risk management is to say, well, what I want to have to have is a risk management model that is relatively simple and therefore definitely wrong, but whose weaknesses and flaws I understand. The the, the alternative approach, which is for, for start, you need to be much cleverer than me, but I also think it's fraught with dangers, is to build very complicated risk models. And, and again, if you're familiar with the, with the mathematical concepts that do things like building higher moments of the distribution, like skew and ketosis and co-skewness and so on and so forth. Um, now the danger with that is that that well the, the, you're you're kind of I think it gives you too much confidence in your risk model. You kind of think well I've I've got all of these numbers, all of these variables, all of these equations. Therefore I I've completely captured every possible risk that's out there in the whole world. Therefore I cannot lose money. You know, uh, and pretty much every person has ever said that in history has end up blowing up and being on the you know Wikipedia page of world's biggest trading losses. Uh, and you know we could I could I could name name names like you know long term capital management or you know Bruno Ixell or and anyone who's who's made this mistake this error. So so my philosophy with risk management is the same as my philosophy with a lot of things, which is have something that's as simple as possible but no simpler. Um, understand its weaknesses, um, and then and be very aware that there's a whole lot of things that can go wrong outside of that that will that will cause me problems. Uh, I'm just to very quickly go back to my early rates trading career. I remember sitting down at the desk and being told to price my first, you know, customer deal. And, um, you know, me expecting to kind of pull out a whole series of very complicated equations to try and do this. Uh, and the the senior trader said to me, no, no, just use um, just use this model, which was the simplest possible model. And I said, but that model's wrong. He's like, yeah. Yeah, but we know it's wrong. We know it's why it's wrong. <laughs> you, you use something more complicated, and and you you won't know what you know what's going on. You know, you'll have no idea what's going on. You're much better off with a simpler tool whose weaknesses you understand. So, so kind of less is more almost within the uh, within that philosophy. Yeah, I mean that's true for risk management, but also true for lots of things. Like for example, in terms of building trading strategies and trading rules, I want my rules to be as simple as possible. And not overcomplicate them just for the sake of overcomplicating them, or for you know a marginal improvement in their historical backtested return, which I know is unlikely to be statistical significant, and is more likely to make the model less robust in the future. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so there's there's something within there that I'm hearing about, and it's interesting you mention LTCM, but it, it's this kind of which they that I they built to succeed. And I'm sort of hearing something, well, let's build something not to fail. And then let's start from there upwards. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to what I was saying earlier about avoiding mistakes. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I like to say there are three main main reasons why traders, systematic traders blow up. Two of them are common to all traders. One we've already mentioned, which is paying too much in trading costs, trading too often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that the, all of these mistakes actually stem from the main mistake you can make, which is being overconfident. Yes. Yeah. If you if you think you can make 100 percent a year, then you're not going to be bothered about paying 50 percent a year in trading costs. Whereas I'm going to be saying, well, that's absurd. I don't think it's possible for me to make 100 percent a year, you know, with, with kind of very little risk. Therefore, I'm not willing to pay that much in trading costs. I'm willing to pay 1% a year in trading costs because I think that I'll make, you know, 15 to 20 percent a year. And that to me is enough then of a margin. That's that. So that's the first mistake. The second mistake, again, that all traders make is taking on too much leverage. 
Um, and again, this is overconfidence because again, if you've got a back test where you're, you're let's say your maximum drawdown is only 10%, then you think, well, I can leverage this thing five times and my maximum drawdown will be 50%. Yeah, I can cope with the 50% drawdown, which by the way is another interesting point because I don't think anyone who's actually lived through a 50% drawdown could cope with it. It's only people who kind of look at the chart on the screen, see it going up and say, yeah, well, I know it goes down 50% there, but I think I can cope with it. If you actually live through 50% drawdowns, you you know, they're psychologically impossible to cope with. Um, so so they look at their uh, strategy and think they can leverage up five times to be perfectly safe because that would give them a maximum of a 50% drawdown. But of course, that's a back test. It's probably overfitted. It's not realistic. Conditions in markets change. And, and so the maximum drawdown isn't 50%. It's actually 100%. And of course, mathematically, you can't recover from a hundred percent drawdown because that's it. You've got you've got no money left. Um, so that that's the the second reason. And 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 I like to describe these two reasons as you know, you can go broke two ways. You can either bleed to death slowly by paying too much in costs, or you can explode quickly by leveraging your account up too much. That that you know, you've got those two options. Or you can do both. Of course, lots of people do. Um, the third problem, which is more specifically for systematic traders, although it, he he kind of can apply to discretionary traders as well is this idea of overfitting so or curve fitting you know building a trading strategy that looks looks at the past says yeah the future is going to be exactly like the past therefore i'm going to build something that's that's very not very robust because if the future is just a little bit different from the past instead of being profitable i will lose money um, and that's why you want something that's as simple as possible because that makes it much harder to to, to make that error but it unlike the first two it's quite hard to know you know if you've overfitted um, you know, it, it doesn't become immediately obvious. You know, you're not, it's like, not like, oh my goodness, I'm paying 20% of my account value every month in costs. That's immediately obvious. Oh my goodness, my leverage is far too high because my, my daily returns are much larger in magnitude than I expected. Uh, but uh, overfitting can take year, years for to become obvious because statistically it's quite hard to, to know when a strategy is underperforming its historic uh, back-tested return. We'll return to the podcast shortly. The FMAN podcast is sponsored by TradeStation Global and the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets where you can trade a range of instruments from one account and leverage professional-grade tools like Radar Screen, The Matrix, and Easy Language. And with TradeStation Global, there are no hidden price spreads, just transparent, low commissions. To find out more and to open an account, visit tradestation international com forward slash alpha mind or go to our website alpha-mind.net or see the link in the episode description the society of technical analysts the sta provide world-beating technical analysis education programs and offer outstanding membership services alpha mind podcast listeners can obtain a 10 percent discount on the cost of their excellent home study course and home study course with a diploma package to find out more about this offer go to our website alpha-mind.net or see the link in the episode description now back to the podcast i hear and i see that overfitting a lot and I, I know I've been guilty of it in in some simple systems that I built although I never actually put them to work partly because I think I wasn't sure you know I, I was aware of the overfitting thing and, and didn't have enough confidence in the system I had because of that or that I'd built um but it, it is I mean you know I think the last two or three years have been a great example of things that have never happened before happening or haven't happened for 20 or 30 years, that classic, um, that classic mistake of thinking, well, it, it hasn't happened for many years, therefore it can never happen again. And, and I, I think every day, in reality, something happens which has never happened before. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and there are there's sort of two ways to cope, or three ways to cope with that, I guess. So one one way would be to do what I prefer, which is to choose strategies which have been tested over many, many decades um, of history um, because yeah okay this year is very different from probably say the mid 2000s or the mid 2010s but in many ways it's quite similar to the mid 1970s because you know we've we've got a war back then it was the arab israeli war we've got commodities going up insanely in value we've got central banks struggling to to cope with controlling inflation um so so i you know it makes me think well again it's another cliched saying but history doesn't repeat but it rhymes um, but if, if you've got, yeah, if you've got a strategy, you've only tested on the last two years or five years or 10 years, um, then you're not going to have enough information to tell you what, what the really difficult periods are going to be like. 
Um, so that that first approach for me is is definitely the best one, which is yeah, just get as much data as you can, find something that works reasonably well in lots of different historical conditions, and then as long as the next historical period is roughly like one of the previous ones, you you'll probably be okay on average. The second approach is is only really valid if you're trading um, with with a very fast trading system. And you, which means that you're basically getting a lot of data every day. You're getting new data and you're getting thousands and thousands of data points. In that environment, you can actually adapt and refit your systems, you know, quite quickly. So if you're trading quickly enough, you could potentially use just a few weeks or a few months of data. And that allows you to become adaptive. So, if, you know, if you move from an environment, you know, of say low zero interest rates pretty much to an environment where interest rates are going up very quickly and that changes the pattern of market volatility, because you've got that ability to fit your systems very quickly, you can adapt effectively. Um, and the third way is, and I probably shouldn't say this because I'm, I'm, you know, doing the opposite of talking my own book when I do so, which is to say, well, don't, if you're, if you are really good, then don't trade systematically because a huge advantage that humans have, at least in theory, over a trading system is the fact that we can adapt immediately. You know, if we can work out what the drivers are, what's going on in the market. Uh, and my the example I was come back to is is 2008 when a small number of people looked at what was happening to U.S. house prices and said, "Well, hang on a second, this is going to have implications for the you know the leverage mortgage-backed securities market and this whole pyramid of debt that's built on top of it." Um, and they were able to infer from that that they should make certain bets in certain markets, and you know obviously some of them did extremely well out of that. Now, no trading strategy could ever have done that because there hadn't been before an environment like that where you'd had both high US house prices that were starting to fall combined with this, you know, these uh, exotic securities that were built on top of it. That was a completely unique and new environment. So yeah, there was there was no way that that anyone um, a, apart from a very smart human being was going to be able to pick on that up on that and react to that quickly enough. Now the problem I have is I'm not one of those guys, right? <laughs> I, you know, I, I I joke that I've made two, maybe three, kind of good market calls in the last 25 years. Um, I, I basically managed to call the the the, the dot com boom bubble, the the bottom of the 2008, the top and the the sort of 2007. I said equities get out of equities. January 2009, I said now is the time to get back into equities. And then in March the 23rd in 2020, I said that this feels like the bottom as well. So I've got a, a track record of predicting turning points. But on the other hand, I'm both self-aware enough and also enough of a statistician to know that, you know what, that doesn't make a track record. Uh, so statistics, it's just probably just a series of statistical flukes. And even if it wasn't, then, you know, trading once every 10 years isn't really enough to kind of get a successful career out of. So <laughs> there are... I think I'll stick with my simple trading systems, which will never be as good as the very best humans or perhaps even as good as me when I'm having one of these once every 10 year epiph epiphanies, but most of the time work pretty well. It's, yeah, I, th I think I think you, you, you do yourself a disservice there. But, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I get a lot of people say, I'll oh, just build a trading system and you'll make money. A and it's just such a hackneyed phrase because you have to build a good trading system. And you have to build, you know, and you have to adapt it. The, the people I know who, who have run good trading systems have evolved them over the years, you know, and um, they, they're, they're not static. They're not, as, and there's a lot of management involved. Um, again, this, this is one thing I know from working with systematic traders, that there's an enormous amount of work goes into, into building them. An enormous amount of work goes into running and monitoring them, and and then of course you have to make sure that you know you're, you're looking for the flaws all the time. But what, what what is your experience of running systems in, in that sense? And is there anything there that resonates with you? Uh, yes and no. So there's an interesting contrast between my previous kind of corporate career when you're you know so we were we were building trading systems, but we also had a lot of people managing them and, you know, software developers and so on and so forth. And we also had tr traders who were actually at the end of the pipeline. We had automatic execution algos, but we also had old school traders who were, you know, ex-life floor guys, uh, all from, from my part of the world, Essex generally. Uh, but but they, in certain markets, they were still better at executing orders than the, the computers were. Um, so we had one computer that would come up with a trade and then 
pass it on to a human being, an old school human being to actually execute it. So, so um, you know, in that in that environment where you've got obviously a big fund, you can afford to employ lots of people who are specialists in lots of areas. Um, and you've also got the fact that, you know, because you're trading with other people's money, there's a certain amount of responsibility that goes with that. There's compliance, there's all these kind of fixed fixed costs and fixed resources that you require. Um, but, but, but at the moment, I'm in a different environment. I'm just trading my own money. Uh, and I have a fundamental problem, which is that I'm extremely lazy. Um, and uh, I have no I have no interest in in spending my whole day babysitting a, a trading strategy and, and making sure it works properly. Uh, so my solution to that is automation. Um, and and my, my trading strategies are pretty much fully automated. Um, now, that that means that the balance of work is different because to create a fully automated trading strategy requires even more upfront work, you know, because the You've, you've got to worry about so many different things. I mean, I was doing some consulting for a, uh, a startup business yesterday and I was trying to explain to them all the possible things that could go wrong when they put an order into the market and the and the and and what they need to think about in terms of taking action from that. It's like, well, what happens if you if you get a partial fill? You know, uh, you know, do you behave? How do you, you know? What do you do about that? How do you behave differently? What happens if the information about being given a partial fill comes back to you and then before you can react to it and that you get the fill, the orders completely filled, you know, so fully automating things. So they run by themselves is, is again, is a huge amount of work up front. Although the, the advantage is once you've done it, you can literally just sit back and well, not quite go to the beach, but it, the, the work is reduced to a relatively small amount of time. Um, the, the other thing, of course, is that the, 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 the more, um, there is actually value to be had from increasing the complexity and breadth of your system. So for example, I don't trade individual equities because that would require much more work in terms of data cleaning and worrying about things like dividends and corporate actions and so on and so forth. Because I'm just trading futures, they're, they're from an operational perspective, much, much easier thing to run. And I, it is realistic for a single person like me to run them in a fully automated way, which with equities would actually not be the case. Similarly with options, would much more complicated asset class to trade would be much more complicated. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing about about trading systematically. I mean, a lot of people get confused and think that automated and systematic and algo trading are all the same thing. They're really not. I mean, someone who is staring at a chart every day and deciding when to buy and sell, if they're doing so according to a set of fixed rules, which they could describe to somebody else, I'm not talking here about a kind of subjective chart reader who's saying, yes, that's definitely a, an abandoned camel pattern or whatever, the, the, you know, with, with an upside down candle or something. Um, I'm talking about someone who can literally write down a set of rules, which could in theory be put into a computer program and done automatically. But it just so happens they don't have the the skill or the time or need to do that. That's still systematic trading and that's still equally valid as, as what I do. Um, the difference is that I don't have to sit and look at charts all day because as I've already mentioned, I'm extremely lazy. <laughs> As someone who's written three, nearly four books, I would never call well, that. Well, okay, La lazy is a strong <laughs> word. What, what I mean is I, I, I enjoy other things more than I enjoy babysitting a trading strategy. So, okay. Okay. so yeah, by, by getting by getting the computer to do that for me, I, I get to focus on on the stuff that I like like to do, like, you know, the research and, and the actual development of strategies and, yeah, writing books. Right, okay, okay. That's brilliant. And, and I do love the idea of just having systems that work away in the background. That's uh, you know that's a nice approach to to later in life, and I presume that they're, they're, they're still returning positive money. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it's it's uh, up and down. But twenty twenty two has generally been a very good year for you know trend following future strategies generally. Um, so yeah, I think I think um, the last couple of months haven't been so good, but the start of the year was very good. I'm still up twenty twenty five thirty percent I think for the year. So. That's um, so yeah, don't, it's been yeah. it's been okay, but it, again, it's about being realistic. So you know the the um, the kinds of returns I'm making, which is you know a good year is twenty twenty five thirty percent, you know yeah. a bad year is flat. Um, for a lot of people, would would be very unremarkable, and 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 um, but but I know that's what I can safely achieve without worrying about leverage and without overfitting my systems and so on. Okay, can I just check when you when you talk about twenty twenty five percent? Because there there are two schools of thought when it comes to pronouncing returns. Retail traders will often often put their return relative to how much sort of trading um, capital they've got, and hedge funds will often talk about how much investment capital they've got. So, for example, a, a retail trader 
sitting there with 50 grand and he turns it into 100 grand within a year, says he's made a 100% return. Um, whereas if we were to compare that maybe to if he sat in a hedge fund, he'd probably call that a 5% return, depending on how much leverage they use, because it depends on how much of that capital he's got compared to how much he's willing to lose. I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Here. Yeah, I know you're making yourself completely clear. So what, one of the yeah. things about futures is they're extremely cash efficient, right? Right. Um, so my my because my leverage target isn't that high. It's a bit higher than most institutions, but an awful lot lower than nearly every retail trader you'll ever meet. Yeah. Um, my typical cash usage is about, say, for the sake of argument, 25% of my account value. Right, okay. So so um, I've, uh, you know, if I've, say, got, I don't know, £400,000 in my trading account, for example, only about £100,000 of that would be required for margin on any given day. So, yeah, if I've made 25% in a year, then that's 25, that's actually 100% of the margin that yeah. I've used. Yeah. But in terms of the amount I've got at risk, which is, for me, at least everything in the account, it's it's 25%. And you're right, that's that's the the way that a hedge fund would think about it. Definitely, it's, it's total capital at risk, not total capital employed. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I, I, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at those two worlds, which, which kind of brings me in sort of, uh, and I'm conscious we've probably got about another 10 minutes, but you've written a book on leverage trading. And I mean, that's quite a rare um, theme to bring up. It, it's a bit of a minefield talking about leverage. Um, yeah, I mean, the um, the interesting thing is actually, there's actually really out, a lot of books out there about about. Um, I'm going to pronounce it leverage. I'm not correcting your pronunciation. It's just that that's the way I've always pronounced it. Um, okay. So I don't want to start a kind of pronunciation war with you, but um, <laughs> okay. I'm not. I think I don't know whether whether my pronunciation is American and yours is the correct British English or not. But but you know, let's. Well, you, let's you're you're from Essex and I'm from Hertfordshire. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, for for listeners at home, there's a there's at least like 25 miles between where we live. So that's that's obviously going to be huge difference in in accents and pronunciation. But anyway. Uh, but back to the book. Yeah. So um, the, the interesting thing is there are actually out there a lot of books on on leverage trading, but they don't call it that. They say, oh, yeah, this is your guide to making money from CFDs or spread bets or, or futures, all of which are instruments that allow you to take leverage and use leverage. Um, but the, the the things that all of these things have in common is because they're leveraged financial instruments, they're inherently riskier than a non-leveraged financial instrument like, you know, just just buying shares, for example, without without any leverage. Uh, and so, the you know, I, I said earlier that a common mistake that nearly every trader makes is using too much leverage. Um, and therefore, the decision about how much leverage you should actually use is probably the most important decision you will make as a trader who's using leveraged instruments. Um, so it struck me that there was a market out there for a book that kind of rather than specifically was about futures, which is a book I'm currently writing, or about CFDs or about spread bets, but was to say, well, you know what? What have these products all got in common? They've all they always leverage, and therefore they're all subject to the same risks and dangers, particularly for less experienced traders. Because of, of all the books I've written or are writing, this one is definitely pitched more at the, at the traders who are, you know, less experienced and more at the retail end, because institutional traders, well, not, with with this, with some very famous exceptions, but tend to on average use less leverage and be in a safer position because of regulation and also experience. Yeah, and, and I think, you, you know, you bring up something that, again, is really important for the, because um, our audience is spread around. We've got professional traders on there. We've got guys in funds. I know we've got guys in banks, energy and commodity, commodity trading firms. But we've got a lot more people who are private traders, retail traders, um, people working from home on their own, um, or perhaps attached to a small group, like a, a small prop firm. And... You know, I, 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 that, that also covers kind of my own private coaching audience. And I know one of the things that I find that's one of the hardest things for people to do is working on their own. Um, although there is a there is a plus side to it. You know, you don't get the toxicity of working with some very, <laughs> you know, some very difficult and, and troubled people. But equally, you don't get the, I would say, the protection of working in a firm. I, I always feel there's kind of three levels of of protection you have as a trader, risk protection. One is your own risk management that you do yourself. Um, that's the first level. The second level is the risk management you get from being in, or, in an organisation that has a risk management function and will tap you on your shoulder every now and then just to check in with what you're doing, occasionally remind yourself, or maybe even just 
just pull the plug on something. And of course, the third level and the final level is the margin call. What happens to private retail traders is they go from one to three without stopping at two. And it's that two, which is the safety net, the real advantage of working in somewhere. And you and you don't see it when you're working on your own. You don't have, and it's always the moment, even if you're very structured, very process orientated, very disciplined, when it creeps up on you, you don't see it. You're lost. Definitely. And, and um, one of the reasons I'm quite a conservative and cautious trader, at least, as I said, the stands of most retail traders, is I've, I've made all the mistakes, you know, and I was lucky enough to be allowed to do it with other people's money. So, <laughs> so um, don't worry, I made them some as well. You know, it wasn't all one way street. But but um, but yeah, so uh, I mean, just taking margin as a specific example, you know, one thing I have every day is a report that tells me how much margin I'm using as a percentage of my account, which is why I could tell you straight away roughly what it was. Um, and, uh, you know, if that goes above a certain level, I'm going to be asking myself questions. So, I'm basically, if if you like, in, in terms of a metaphor, if if the, the 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 kind of edge of the cliff is the the margin call, I, I've painted a white line for myself, sort of twenty yards away from the edge of the cliff, so I can I can look down and go, well, hang on a second, you know, this this is the level at which um, you know I'm uncomfortable, and I actually have fixed rules that I set myself, which say basically if my margin requirement goes above a certain level, I will automatically deleverage my system. Um, so if you like, I've kind of put into place the sort of firm level stuff. Now, of course, the there's an important point here, which is that I could override that with the press of a button if I wanted to. But it's that, it, you know, that that would require some effort and thought on my part. So um, the, the point is I'm making it as difficult as possible for me to make mistakes. It's a little bit, you know, they like the idea of nudge. I, you know, I'm kind of nudging myself, a, a, you know, away from making an error by making it very difficult for me to to do to kind of override that because I need to find the right piece of code and change the code and, and you know, delete the code and then reinstall the library and all this kind of stuff. So it would be quite a major pain in the neck to do that. So, so um, you know, obviously that's not for everybody because as I said, I've got the advantage of being fully automated. But even as a non-automated trader, I, I think you can put these, you know, guardrails, if you like, in place um, that you'd have in a in a, an institutional environment, like something simple, like, yeah, if my percentage of margin goes over a certain level, I don't just ignore it and hope it'll go away. I actually actively do something about it. See, that, see that, that, that's brilliant. And I think that's the, as you say, that's the big advantage of working in some sort of institutional level. You will have experienced that at some point. And even if you haven't, you will have seen it with people around you and you become acutely aware of how dangerous that is and how, as humans, we're all capable of doing that. But, you know, and in fact, the more we think we're not capable of it, the more at risk you are of, of being like that. And, and I had a, a coaching client once, and she was a phenomenal trader, phenomenal private trader. She used to work in investment banks, so she had the experience there. And she, you know, she she was fully discretionary. She'd literally trade from her bed on her mobile phone with some serious bucks at, at stake on a spread bet account. And she could make seven figures in one evening on a big event, say a, 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 an election or, you know, a Brexit night. And she said, you know, Steve, I don't have the self-control that I need that could allow me to get to a margin call moment. So what I do is I keep my main money in an account, in an overseas account, where it takes me 24 hours to restock my account. And she said, that is my, that's my middle risk management level. And, you know, it's brilliant because she said, you know, it has happened a couple of times where she's emptied her trading account and she was trying to get money in there immediately, but she, she literally couldn't. And she said, with the, you know, the benefit of 24 hours delay, I was so pleased I didn't. Yeah, it's an old it's an old story, isn't it? Because um, and I in the I think it's the first chapter of my first book. I quote the story of Odysseus having to getting his crew to tie himself to the mast so he could listen to the the cries of the the sirens and, and yes. not be, be dra dragged onto the rocks while he got his crew to kind of cover their ears. So uh, yeah, this this idea of of having some kind of well, an economist would call it a commitment mechanism. Um, so that 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 basically you it makes it very difficult for you to do what you know is already wrong. I um, mean, it's yeah. like if you're on a diet, you know, locking locking the chocolates in a in a in a box with a padlock, and then and then putting the the key in a block of ice in the freezer or something. So like, if you really want those chocolates, you're going to have to get a quite a lot of effort to get them. What a genius idea! I would try that now, although I know that I would straight away put the ice in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously need an even stronger commitment mechanism than that, Steve. Yeah, you know, listen, this has been great, and uh, I've really enjoyed this, and we've talked about some some topics which don't normally get talked about. And, you know, to talk about them 
with with someone of your level of experience is fantastic and, and hopefully great great for our audience um just again how i mean how can people get to know more about you and find out about you so i'm on twitter uh, my right. handle is at investing idiocy which always amuses everybody <laughs> it says a lot <laughs> <laughs> and uh my main website is um systematicmoney.org uh which has got links to my blog where i write and tend to try and write a blog piece every month or so uh also links to all my, my various books and li also links to um if, if you are into to programming my actual trading system System that I use is actually open sourced so anyone can download it and use it at least in theory um, so yeah that, that's all on my main website oh fantastic and we will repeat those details they'll be on the show notes that accompany this um, with whichever service you use um, or on our blog or our newsletter which you'll follow as well with the uh, the show okay look it's, it's as I said, it's been an honour to be with you. It's a shame Mark couldn't be here because I know he'd have really enjoyed this conversation as well. I want to say thank you very much for giving us your time. I'm already looking forward to having you back on the show when your book comes out next year. Very much like to, to repeat this experience, Steve. It has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. We would like to thank our podcast sponsorship partners, Trade Station Global and the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can find out more about our sponsors at our website, alpha-mind.net, or see the link in the episode description. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets where you can trade a range of instruments from one single account and leverage professional-grade trading tools. Visit tradestation-international.com forward slash alpha-mind to know more. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, provide well-beating technical analysis education programs. AlphaMind podcast listeners can obtain a 10% discount off the cost of their excellent home study course. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you could leave a friendly review or provide a rating for the show on whichever podcast service you use. You can find out more about us at our website, alpha-mind.net. You can follow us on Twitter at alphamind101 and at alphamind102. And you can connect with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall on LinkedIn. You can also follow us and can check back over some of our past episodes on the alphamindpodcast.com. We wish you the best of luck in the markets. Have a good week. Thank you.